Hi, everybody. I'm ABC's Catherine Falders, joined by Ryan Strzok, who is having a great time on the second day of the new year. We're decked out here with 2017 signs, and I think this makes noise. It, I, go for it. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Did I scare you yet? We'll, we'll, we'll put that one away. <laughs> so there's no question this has absolutely been a crazy year on the uh, political field, right, Ryan? It certainly has. We're diving into 2017, don't really know what to expect, but we wanted to pause for a minute and kind of take a look back at 2016. So Ryan and I put together our top 10 moments. I have to tell you, it was hard. We were going to do five and then... We probably could have done a hundred, to be honest. We probably could have done a hundred, so it took a it's, while to figure these out, it, but number it, 10... We're ready to, to launch right in here. Tell us about number 10. So the first one that we want to uh, go over is actually from our ABC News debate. Ryan, come over here. Well, we have signs, too. Number 10. It's actually Marco Rubio. He was a robot and repeated the same line, what, four times? Four times. This was an ABC News debate, Catherine, that came right after the Iowa caucuses. Marco Rubio took third place there, was trying to kind of gun for this momentum into New Hampshire. This was supposed to be his moment. It was. And uh, it all kind of fell apart in that debate. Let's take so, a look. We want to show you this clip. Our friends at Time Magazine put together a uh, compilation of it. Once and for all with this fiction that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. Barack Obama is undertaking a systematic effort to change this country. So let's dispel with this fiction that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. He is trying to change this country. He wants America to become more like the rest of the world. See. Those are the facts. Here's the bottom line. This notion that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing is just not there true. There it is. He knows exactly what he's doing. There it is. The he's memorized 25-second speech. Because I think this notion, I think this is an important point. We have to understand what we're going through here. We are not facing a president that doesn't know what he's doing. He knows what he is doing. That's why he's done the things he's done. You know, That's why we have a president that passed Obamacare and the stimulus. All this damage he's done to America is deliberate. Okay, right. Let's dispel one. So I really can't get through that without laughing. Obviously, you saw Chris Christie there fire back, and that really became the start of Robot Rubio. Exactly. His opponents really seized on that. You mentioned Christie. Donald Trump also criticized him. And when New Hampshire rolled around, uh, Marco Rubio definitely did not have the performance he wanted, and it, you know, really uh, stopped his run for the nomination in a lot of ways. So let's go to number nine. Ryan, bringing back Mitt Romney, former Republican presidential Number candidate. Nine. Number nine. Tape it on up there, Ryan. So this goes back to Mitt Romney's speech on March 3rd, where he called Trump a con man, a fake, a phony, and a fraud. Um, well, we thought this was going to work, but did it? Uh, it did not. <laughs> uh, this is really an unprecedented moment in American politics here, where the previous nominee of a party, Mitt Romney, intervenes in a current a uh, contest for the nomination and just completely bashes the front runner of the party. And as you know, Donald Trump fired back on the campaign trail against Mitt Romney a lot on this. And at the end of the day, Mitt Romney was uh, just vetted for Secretary of State. He um, went out to met with Trump, I think twice, um, went out to dinner with him. Mm -hmm. You saw the two together. It looked like they were becoming friends and no longer foes. However, Romney never apologized. That's right. And after that kind of really public display of, you know, disgust at the, you know, uh, the eventual nominee of the party, uh, it didn't do a whole lot of damage to him. It didn't work out too well for Mitt Romney. So we are moving on to number eight. Ryan, this is a big one, right? This is Catherine. This one had a lot of influence uh, in several areas of the campaign, mostly, though, on the Democratic side. WikiLeaks. So, and this ties into a lot of what we're talking about now with Donald Trump and Russia. As you know, the U.S. intel community says that the Russians are behind hacking the DNC database. Are we losing our tape over there? A little bit. <laughs> as well as Clinton's campaign chairman, John Podesta. So what WikiLeaks did here really was the last month of the campaign did a massive email dump of John Podesta's personal emails. And, and what did we see in those, Ryan? That's right. Well, we saw these kind of intimate conversations that were happening in Hillary Clinton's campaign staff's inner circle. Everything, uh, their criticisms about the candidate, some emails from Hillary Clinton herself. You know, there weren't any kind of major bombshells, but the way that WikiLeaks released these stolen emails over the course of the last month of the campaign really kind of created this drip, drip, drip effect uh, that constantly had these, uh, these kind of minor revelations in the headlines. And it did really fuel the Hillary Clinton email narrative. We saw emails in, in the WikiLeaks dump um, about the DNC showing that the party was splintered about Bernie Sanders, even criticism 
even staff criticism of their own candidate, sure, Hillary and Clinton. It, and it really led to the demise of Debbie Wasserman Schultz as the chair of the DNC earlier in the campaign and led to some pretty major criticisms about the way they handled their primary process. All right, so we're going to go on to number seven. We're bringing back Bernie Sanders here. What is this one, Ryan? Number Bernie's seven. surprise win in Michigan. And, and, and you know a lot about this one. Obviously, it was a big um, upset for Hillary Clinton and really, really kept Bernie Sanders going, especially at a time when Clinton wanted to move forward into the general election. Trump was already the presumptive nominee moving forward. Talk a little bit about Bernie there. Yeah, well, you know, Clinton had this kind of major... A stretch of victories in the primaries on uh, March 1. And then we moved to the Michigan primary pretty much immediately after that. Bernie Sanders needed something, a miracle essentially, in order to remain even somewhat competitive in that process. And he got this really unexpected surprise win in Michigan, a pretty major state, a state that showed to be really crucial in the general election. And uh, it really kind of gave him a rationale and gave him his supporters some, uh, you know, much needed enthusiasm to drag that primary out. Uh, but like what you, like you said, uh, it really uh, prevented Hillary Clinton from launching into a general election mode and really prolonged that primary for several months. Right. All right, let's put number six up there. This is a Republican convention, and it was really hard picking out a moment from this, I think, Ryan. You and I were both was, there. There were so many. There were so many. A lot of drama. Um, but really here, this is you know, Cruz gives a speech at the Republican convention after dropping out, and he tells people to vote their conscience, right? He does not endorse Donald Trump. It's a huge spectacle if any of you viewers there were at the convention. We were on the floor. Trump was not happy. He walked in the back. That's right. I remember sitting there, Catherine. We were in the bowl of the arena people there. People started booing and Ted Cruz. We were watching Ted Cruz, and folks were booing. You were on the floor near, uh, near his wife, who was on the floor. And uh, I remember one of our coworkers sitting next to me saying, Brian, Brian, look. To, to your right, and I turned, and there, Donald Trump, the, the nominee, the presumptive nominee, was walking down the back staircase in the middle of the speech from essentially the runner-up. It was really unbelievable. I mean, you're watching Ted Cruz on stage, then he's getting booed, and Trump walks in the back, and then Heidi Cruz and his father, Rafael Cruz, were escorted out because of security reasons, as uh, Ken Cuccinelli from Virginia noted. But what's significant there is the non-endorsement. I mean, we were, um, Ryan and I were at a Ted Cruz event that day mm -hmm. when Cruz's camp, former campaign manager, Jeff Rowe, was getting a call from Paul Manafort, the campaign manager at the time, and that's what it was about. Any last endorsements. And he did not pull the trigger. Trump knew. Trump knew that he wasn't going to endorse. So whether this whole thing was planned or not is still be, to be determined. Right, and I think the phrase that Ted Cruz used at that time, vote your conscience, that had some, some, some significance at the Republican convention because that was kind of the rallying cry of those last delegates who were still holding out hope to block Trump's nomination. And it should be noted with this, Cruz has since endorsed Trump, but after that convention speech, Cruz walked into his own delegation breakfast and it was fascinating. It was a split between people booing him and cheering from him, standing on their seats and saying that he's an awful person. And, and, and Cruz, his decision to not endorse was because Donald Trump had criticized his wife and even accused his father of being involved in the assassination of JFK in some way. So Cruz was not backing down. He ultimately did though, That's right. endorse. That's right. Um, all number, right. Number five. That was a long. That was a long one. There's a lot of news out of that Republican convention, Ryan, and I don't even think we touched on all of it. But number five. Here we go. This was Clinton has pneumonia. So th this um, health episode with Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. happened. Um, at which he was attending the 9-11 memorial. We have video of that, but what, what exactly happened there, Ryan? So uh, this kind of uh, video emerged after Hillary Clinton left this kind of 9-11 event a little bit early. Nobody had know, knew where she had gone. Uh, her aides at first said that she was dehydrated and overheated. And then this video emerged of her getting into her van. We're gonna show you that in a minute. And um, uh, yeah, and it later came out that she had uh, been diagnosed with pneumonia but hadn't told anyone and had continued on the campaign trail and it just kind of raised some questions about, about her health and, um, you know, her, her disclosure of that as oh, well. We'll show you that video from our uh, friends over at CNN. Oh, this is ours. Oh, this, this one is ours. Oh, oops. <laughs> So this is Hillary Clinton getting into the van there. Yep. 
So, in that video, Ryan, that video, um, not only, I mean, everything that you just said about her being dehydrated and overheated and later learning that she had pneumonia, it, what was so significant about it was that Trump had attacked her health previously, and, and it gave him that momentum to continue to attack her stamina during his rallies and on the campaign trail. That's right, and that was the line on the campaign trail, was I have the stamina to be president, she doesn't, and he continued to allude to that really until the final days of the campaign. All right, number four, this is another Hillary Clinton one. Um, this was her basket of deplorables line, right, Ryan? That's right. We're gonna play this audio for you, and this one is from our uh, friends over at CNN. Be grossly generalistic, you could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. Right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. But that other basket of people are people who feel the government has let them down, the economy, You saw while we were watching that video, we had kind of this row of ads pop up on the side <laughs> there. And that just kind of, I guess, shows how much this kind of insult on Trump supporters really became a rallying cry. It, it really did. And, and being out on the campaign trail there with Donald Trump, he used it after that in, in every speech. We're just a basket of deplorables. And, and it wasn't a great line. At the end of the day, it wasn't because Trump latched onto it all of a sudden at Trump rallies, all of the... Think that you could buy, but there was button shirts, people wearing, you know, deplorable me shirts. So at the end of the day, it uh, did not go over too well for, for her, and he continued to use that for the remainder of the campaign. That's right. All well, right. as we approach our final three now, we have a couple honorable mentions. We mentioned at the beginning that we couldn't fit them all in. So here are just a couple of our, uh, a couple of our favorites. Oh right my now, goodness. That didn't make the cut. What are they? All right, here we go. So, oh, I can't, I just laugh so much about this. Fiorina had a lot of, Carly Fiorina, former Hewlett Packard CEO and uh, 2016 Republican candidate, had a lot of uh, stage issues, didn't she, Ryan? That's right. Well, during one of her events when she was a presidential candidate, the uh, curtain ended up falling down at one of her events. And thank God Nearly she was not injured. Correct. Uh, but then, when she, in the event where she was announced as Ted Cruz's running mate, as kind of this Hail Mary effort to block Trump before Indiana, uh, she took a tumble off of the stage at that event as well. So right, uh, a, that tough, was, uh, a tough stretch for her. Not yeah. good for uh, Miss Fiorina there. So, and then I think we had, now that we're going over this, I feel like we have a lot of uh, candidates with stage issues. Uh, right. Ben Carson uh, at our own debate did not, did not hear his name and was awkwardly standing there. I wish we had that video to play for you, but I'm sure you guys have seen it multiple times now. Um, was just standing there while all of the other candidates walked by and didn't hear it. Was, I, can't, I can't even get through it without laughing, but what, which other ones do we have here, well, one, of the, one of the highlights as well was uh, Jeb Bush on the campaign trail in New Hampshire, really trying to make a big push there. Uh, did not get any applause on one of his applause lines and ended up telling his audience to please clap. Not That's um, unfortunate not because especially in uh, New Hampshire, the state where he spent a lot of time. That's right. That was that was kind of the one that he was going to win and uh, that that event didn't work out. Yeah. Oh, and then of course Bernie Sanders uh, took on a new nickname actually on social media for about a day. What were they calling him, Ryan? They're calling him Birdie Sanders <laughs> after a bird landed on the podium at one of his events. Oh, uh, perfectly I, staged there. I mean, you can't it, make it, it was, up. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. Couldn't make it up. And then, of course, to bring back in, we have to touch on the Aleppo moment. That's right. Gary Johnson, the Libertarian candidate. This was supposed to be a really, you know, promising year for third-party candidates and uh, didn't really work out that way. He did get a lot of attention for it, though. That's right. On MSNBC did, with... Uh, did not know uh, what, what Aleppo was. was. So there was that. And, of course, uh, Rubio's feud with Donald Trump over his hands. That's right. Rubio uh, saying that Donald Trump had small hands. Yes. And um, that vice happened. versa. And, yeah, and was, then there was the debate over hands. That... 2016. That's what happened. 2016, 2016 right in a nutshell. Let's go to number three. Top three. All right. This is a big one. And this is um, the Donald Trump Access Hollywood 2005 tape with, with Billy Bush, right, Ryan? And, and this one, it, 
We'll play the video for you and then talk about the significance. So, right. there we go. So that was the video. What right. was the so video? This is, this is a live mic moment uh, when Donald Trump is kind of getting ready for an Access Hollywood tape, and uh, the Washington Post ends up breaking this story and releasing this video with with some pretty uh, some pretty uh, raunchy kind of graphic audio that, that we're not gonna play here right now right but um, but you've probably seen online and uh, that ended up being a major crisis for Trump's campaign just a month out it, it did I mean that that video was extremely significant a lot of people were saying that was the moment there were a lot of moments that we thought were the moment for Donald Trump's campaign to go south it didn't um, this video was it he was losing Republican support. He was supposed to attend a rally in Michigan. Paul Ryan backed out. Mike Pence was supposed to go in his place, backed out of that too. There were questions and, whether whether Trump should drop out of the race and, and if and, Pence would leave the ticket. Right, and Donald Trump ended up releasing an apology video that night as Republican criticism just piled up throughout the night. Uh, he ended up releasing an apology late that night uh, pretty rare for this candidate, saying that he was sorry and that he's changed since and then, that he and was he regrets wrong. his words. Right. He said, "I'm sorry. I, I said it. It was wrong." One of one of Donald Trump's uh, favorite words on the campaign trail. But we did see Trump that day too. Uh, after that video came out, he spent a long time in Trump Tower deliberating with his aides upstairs. I was at Trump Tower. Then he just appeared and came out and waved to his fans. Another reporter asked him if he was dropping out. He said he was still staying in the race. That was earlier that day. Mm -hmm. um, he apologized. The apology ran yeah. on live television. That was that, that right, was Ryan? That. that was that. All righty. Number, Number two, two was another October surprise. All right, so this one is Comey saying, talking about the new Hillary Clinton emails in a letter to Congress. Ryan, you know a lot about this one. Take us through what exactly happened. Yeah, so the, so the FBI director, uh, the FBI had been investigating Hillary Clinton's kind of treatment of classified information in her emails, and uh, the director had come out and said that he was not going to prosecute any case against Hillary Clinton for mishandling that. But two weeks before the election, Catherine, he comes out in a letter to Congress and says, wait a minute, we think we found some more emails that uh, may be pertinent to Clinton's uh, investigation. So on a shared laptop between Anthony Weiner and Huma Abedin, Huma being a, a longtime Clinton aide and Anthony Weiner being a uh, former New York City politician who was under investigation for a sexting scandal, uh, the FBI believed that they may have found some more emails uh, that may be germane to their investigation, but they hadn't looked through them yet. They didn't know what was there, and uh, Director Comey decided that he wanted to take this information to the American people, to Congress, let them know that this was new and happening, and uh, he faced some criticism for that. He did, and when the first letter came out, Hillary Clinton, Secretary Clinton, was on an airplane. And she was flying to a rally. None of the reporters knew about it. The plane landed. And everyone was finding out about the news. All the reporters were waiting for her. She was on the plane, and, and she didn't want to comment on it. I mean, it's just, it was fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So six days later, the, the FBI de devotes a lot of resources to digging into this. And six days later, Director Comey uh, comes out again and says um, there weren't any, he, he wasn't changing his recommendation to not prosecute. Uh, Hillary Clinton. And, and since the election, what has the Clinton campaign said? Well, they've said that uh, that kind of uh, re-upping the uh, Clinton scan, the Clinton email scandal, really hurt them down the stretch, and they've blamed, they've essentially blamed Director Comey for uh, for the loss. All right, Ryan, we're moving on to number one. What do we got? The final, the biggest uh, political moment in 2016. Here it is. Election, Election Day upset. Day. It really was unprecedented. That's right. A lot of folks, uh, you know, we were talking to aides on both sides, uh, Senate aides, presidential campaign aides, kind of uh, journalists. We were looking at our polling. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, we played a pretty big, a big role in 
uh, our kind of race ratings on the electoral map, and um, just a very like surprising upset uh, that I'm not sure uh, anybody really saw coming. No, absolutely not. I mean, I was at Donald Trump's um, election night party. Mm -hmm. I guess you could call it that. It, it wasn't. It wasn't much of a party. He had a small ballroom at the Hilton Hotel. It, and there, nobody was really jazzed up, Ryan. And then we were all looking at the exit polls. It was the, the same feeling. Nobody saw this coming. And then all of a sudden, the results were pouring in, and, and the, the room started filling up. And it, it was really amazing. And, and I think if you look at the electoral map, he really swept all of those battleground states. And you know, Trump says, I don't think anybody worked as hard as I did in the last week of the election. And I have to say, that that's right. He was He was... His days were longer than the 24 hours, crossing time zones, going to mm -hmm. all sorts of different states. I think he had about you know, five rallies the last day. Um, Hillary Clinton worked hard too. Nobody expected this this result. That's right. And really, you have you know one of the more one of like the most you know the longest resume. One of the most qualified you know polls showed that voters thought that Hillary Clinton was really qualified for the role. Um, and here, this this uh, separate candidate who. Uh, is you know the first in centuries to not have military or elected political experience running against this and Donald Trump was able to not only take all of these traditional swing states but he was able to sweep across the Rust Belt with victories in Michigan and Wisconsin states that many people did not even think were on the table until the last week of the campaign. Exactly Ryan and I think Mike Pence um, former governor of Indiana balanced the ticket a little bit with that political experience. But mm -hmm. it still was a very unprecedented election and it's still to be determined uh, what 2017 holds. And as you guys know, Donald Trump is back in New York City now, continuing to fill out his cabinet. He's appointed mm -hmm. um, much of his cabinet. We have Secretary of State, AG, the, the big ones we're still waiting on. What are we still waiting on? Um, uh, <laughs> agriculture, uh, yeah, a couple and of the agriculture roles in the uh, in the VA. So but, you know, Democrats on the Hill are already. You know, Congress comes back tomorrow, and Democrats on the Hill are already starting to point out which candidates they're going to really focus on trying to block. Yeah, exactly, and, and President Obama will be up on the Hill uh, on Wednesday, we believe, and, and Mike Pence will be up there too. So he he's going to be that liaison between the White House and the Hill. So it should all it should all be pretty interesting. I mean, maybe it will. And, and, you know, we mentioned that tension between Paul Ryan and Donald Trump before. So it really kind of remains to be seen how a Trump White House is going to cooperate with the two kind of Republican houses in Congress. Uh, that dynamic is going to be crucial to kind of how swiftly this unified Republican government moves. So I think that's all the time we have for you guys. I need to put it back is. on my hat, Ryan. Yeah, I mean, bring, bring, I, the, bring, I was the, just bring like, your, oh, hold uh, on. Bring this thing back for a minute, too. So because welcome I to think the second day of, uh, oh, my gosh. I don't know if it's centered. Um, 2017, this was a lot of fun. I'm it so was. glad we, we came up with 10 minutes. We literally had 100 things we, on a piece of paper. It took some time. We, it took we some time. Really Maybe, like, yeah. You, uh, hit us up on Twitter or the comments below. You can let us know uh, which ones we missed, which ones you would have put in there. Instead. Yes, we're totally open to suggestions and, and to hear what you guys think. Thank you, to, thank you so much for joining us on ABC News Politics and ABCNews.com. We look forward to seeing you again. Ryan and I are so happy to be back here with you. We will do this again in 2018. Thank you.